first contest was in 1980-something. It's at the Chicago Blowout. They had a street contest down in downtown Chicago. It's put on by Sandy's and some other surf shop. And uh, I was sort of skating for Walker, but I sort of wasn't. It's like the, I was like, I just got on the team, but I hadn't received anything yet, so I went to this contest anyway. And I was riding a Sims Rocco board, and I just put a bunch of Walker stickers on it. The very first time, well, okay, I always, I was thriving. I wanted to skate a contest because I was one of those kids like, yeah, I think I'm good enough and everything. So, I mean, fun was a big part of my skating back then. So I went into the contest and I entered. I didn't know what to enter, 1A or 2A. I felt pretty confident, so I entered 1A. But I figured out that, I mean, contests weren't anything, but I was still nervous just because the competition factor. But it was fun just to hang out with my friends. But I was really, really nervous because I never, I was so used to skating sessions, not skating for a minute and a half and having everybody watch you. So I was pretty much nervous. Hey, can you remember that Papano contest? That one guy, Bobby Moore? <laughs> first competition is like it's like anybody you're really nervous probably the first time it's like you're incredibly nervous and it seemed like you just out of control and just to do your best to stay in control and kind of figure out what's going on because you you get in your own little world and you're really nervous and you that's when you start making mistakes and everything you're not thinking about what's going on <laughs> I don't know, contests aren't really that scary. Just, they don't mean anything. A lot of times they do, but it doesn't matter if you're skating bad one day, skating good the next day, it doesn't, doesn't matter. If you beat someone, it doesn't mean you're better than them. Contests mean about, about nothing. It's like trying to judge two painters against each other. So what is a competition? The dictionary says that a competition is competing, rivalry, a contest, a match. Large contests are held all over the country by organizations such as the National Skateboard Association. Smaller contests are held by local skateboard shops. These contests, whether big or small, are designed to give amateur and pro skaters an opportunity to challenge others within the same age group or skating ability. All your available choices to find out about competitions are the NSA in California, the ESA in Joyce, I believe. Uh, I believe there's a mess, the mid, the mid something, 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 M-E-S-S. Then there's Mars series over in the Midwest. Uh, I believe that's about it. Uh, competition, you can look them up in like Trans World, or you can get to a local skate shop, they might have flowers hanging around. Or it's like, you just like, you know, flow of the mouth. Your friends or something like that can tell you about a contest. 
and you know if you're really into it you'll get together and y'all do something with it well competitions are easy to get into you can find them just about anywhere they're they're pretty much set up for the skaters by different skate shops and organizations um the only thing i can say about getting into competitions is you've got to realize your ability and try and categorize yourself in certain groups of the competition um, 1A, 2A, 3A sponsored, which is like beginner, intermediate, advanced type deal. And you don't, you want to be fair to the other skaters. You want to categorize yourself into a division that is, that suits your ability. And that way, that way you're not, you're competing against people of your same ability, age, etc. Compete in your own level and not compete in any level above or below yours. It's just, it's not right. It doesn't work out right. For other skaters and for yourself, uh, you advance a lot more. And when you skate with better skaters, you know. But if you compete within your own group, you tend to place better. It looks better in your resume. And uh, know, it's basically it. You have to try real hard. It's not easy. What brought me success was just hard work and practice. Because none of it ever came easy for me. It's something I had to work at and work at a lot. And that's true for anything. You know, there are a few people that are naturally talented in, in, the, in skating or whatever else, but for most people, you do have to work for it. Okay, what I do to get ready for a competition is usually a couple weeks uh, beforehand, I'll, I'll set up like a schedule of skating. Like, not skating every day, but almost every other day, taking it easy. I don't want to burn out. And because uh, I've done it before, I experienced it, like I've skated every day before a contest. You get to the contest, you got pulled muscles, and so what you need to do is stretch out a lot. It's a lot of stretching and preparation for a skateboard contest is very important. Some people hate contests, and they're not really that much fun. The, the, the practice and the street skating and all with friends is fun, and they are fun after they're over. But, you know, usually while you're actually competing, it's not fun, you know, you're nervous. And then when it's over, that's when all the fun takes place. I compete because of the adrenaline rush. I compete because it's fun. I mean, um, it gives you coverage too. It's like NSA is like the biggest, and they I seen they seen a control skateboard. But when you compete with them, they make you feel like if you're pro and like they really boost your career. They help you get in the magazine. I, I guess it's just fun. You get to meet a lot of people, and it's. It's really fun. That's all I guess it was about fun. I really don't compete to compete, you know, for the competition. I compete because it's, to me, it's like a, a gathering of people I don't get to see all the time because I live on the East Coast and a lot of my friends that, you know, in, this, in the skating community live on the West Coast. And the only time I get to see them is at competition, so I enjoy going for that reason. But, you know, sometimes I get stressed out at competitions because I start to get into it, but you know, I, I try not to let it get me down. It's no big, really no big deal. It's just fun. It's a game. Um, contest um, and freestyle from beginning to end, it's basically you'll have a, you have like maybe two runs of like preliminary runs. And if you, if you get in like the top 15 to, to make the cut to the finals, they'll give you another two minute run for a final run and then they'll just take that run. Um, as far as judging goes, what judges look for and what they should look for sometimes that it is a difference there um, consistency is the main thing what is what a judge should look for uh, degree of difficulty next definitely and that's more or less where the subjective part comes in because the difference between consistency with the easy run and uh, say a, a, a run with that has a higher degree of difficulty if, if somebody misses tricks in that run, then, then there is subjectiveness as far as you know, where the line is drawn besides between consistency and degree of difficulty. And then after that would have to be style, number of tricks, um, and I guess on down after that, whatever else appeals to the judge. The judges look for style and consistency, difficulty of tricks, and the height of the errors that you use, and the amount of the ramp that you use. If you're just going straight back and forth using 16 feet of a 32 foot wide ramp, you're not going to get scored as high as if you use the whole ramp. Well, different judges look for different things, unfortunately. Uh, judges, I think, should judge on what the individual does right then and there, no matter who they are, who they ride for, 
And I don't think that that intentionally happens a lot, but it seems to be a subconscious thing with a lot of the judging. People judge people, it seems to be, on what they know they can do, what they've seen them do in a video, or what they've seen them do in a contest or in practice. And then when they get out there, if they're a big name person, a lot of times they automatically get a good score. Just right off the bat, automatic. You know? And I don't think it's an intentional thing on the judges. I think it's just something that subconsciously takes effect. They look for style. Um, they look for flow. They look for difficult tricks. They look for speed. They want to see. They want to see somebody who's going to skate fast. With a lot of styles going to do hard tricks. That's what they want to see. And they they want to see them make everyone. That's what judges are looking for. That's like the perfect one for somebody who's just like hauling booty all around the place and making everything and doing really hard stuff. The NSA's got a good group of judges. But... Judges look for in the run. It's like you hit like all the parts of the course, like certain ramps. And like if they if they're hip to all the new tricks are out today, they know what tricks are. Or unless you just got your total own style and just go around there like do like real hard trick where it's like they can't even judge it, you know? Because like they're so intense. Like, the judges' scores in contests are typically on a one to a hundred point scale. So a typical a typical judge's score might be like a eighty two, a seventy eight, a ninety one, somewhere around in there. In, uh, in local contests, the judges are usually just fellow skaters who are in different divisions. When you get into your bigger contests, usually there's pros involved if there's amateur skaters. Um, during pro contests, I would say there are uh, prominent people in the industry. The board of directors of the NSA, um, they pick the judges. They pick pretty qualified judges, I think. The inner contest, simple. Uh, you just like you get to the location and you, you sign your name. If it's, like, if it's local, I guess, your parents have to sign for you, you know, if you're on 18, that type of deal. And um, you just sign up and just go out there and do what you can do. I mean, do your best. Hopefully you'll get a prize at the end. That's what I always thought. <laughs> uh, some of the skaters that have done really well in the sport of skateboarding are kind of some of the obvious choices that people might come up with, like Christian Hosoy, Tony Hawk, uh, Steve Caballero, skaters of that caliber, uh, what separates them from other skaters? Well, initially, I think uh, they are in a very rare breed of uh, individual to begin with. They come out of a rare mold. I think the fact that they've been able to get a lot of media coverage and attention uh, helps people recognize them in contests. The judges recognize them. Uh, it's a little easier for them to get a higher score in a contest because they're recognizable. But on the other hand, I'm, I don't mean to say that they're getting what they're getting because of media. What I am saying is that the media has a big effect on not only the public's perception of these skaters, but their own perception of themselves. So you take a really highly talented individual like a couple of these guys I named, and you back it up with everything I've been talking about media-wise and real self-confidence growing within them, they start winning contests, they really gain confidence, and pretty soon it reaches a point where they become the best skaters. I mean, they truly are, and they are deservingly winning those contests, and they're beating people who might have the same potential that they do, who don't have the same particular breaks with media coverage or whatever, but... Uh, it's still valid that they are up there in ability, and people call them the best, they're probably right. Savannah, I swear, Jason Lee and Tom Knox skate so fast. I think that's what pro skaters are, man. I think that's the difference between sponsored and the pro skaters. The pro skaters, they can skate anything, they skate so fast. Uh, I think you shouldn't go pro until, man, you just skate everything, skate it fast. My most exciting part of competition would probably be after it's over with, because I usually get so nervous while I'm out there. And it's like midway through my routine, just going, God, I can't wait till it's done. But uh, usually afterwards is, is the funnest part, because you know all this tension for weeks and weeks of, of thinking of the contest coming up, getting ready, preparing for it. You know, and then it's finally over with. It's like the biggest relief in the world. It's like it's really good. It's a good feeling. And hopefully you do good. <laughs> uh, signing is like getting ready for it because I like to be prepared. I mean, I like to sit there and make myself like real nervous and then that way I skate my best because I like to 
I like the crowd, you know, the excitement, so it really pushes me. I like to win, you know. If a friend of mine was competing for the first time, I'd tell him just to be relaxed, do only tricks that he knows he can make, and not really stress out about it because it's not that big a deal. I mean, contests are kind of a big deal. I mean, you have to take it in stride, you know. It's not like if you don't win this contest, your life's going to end and somebody's going to come and get you and put you in a big black hole somewhere. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not the major, you know, it's just fun. Try to keep yourself calm. Just try to think about other stuff beforehand. Don't really concentrate on the contest. And don't practice a lot. A lot of people get burned out. They, they just practice all day long, all day long, and then when their heat comes, they're like really exhausted when it comes and they really don't you know, skate as good as they've been skating all day long and stuff like that. Just, just do what you think it, you know, is good. Do your, do your tricks that you know how to do really well. Just go out and have fun for yourself, not really for other people. During the competition, I'm very, very nervous, it seems like. Like, you know, before, and every, it's not just me, though. It's like everybody else is like that, too. They're all going, uh, good luck, you know, and they're going, oh, I'm nervous, you know. But you just, you know, what you got to do is just think about yourself and what I was thinking of. And I've done it in my last contest in uh, Kentucky was when I went out there, I was just like, Instead of trying to skate against everyone else, I was trying to skate against myself because there's a certain part of you that gets nervous that wants to fall. And so you just say, no, I'm, I'm not going to fall. I'm going to beat you, the part of you, and make it. And so that's you got to think like that, I guess. Um, don't take it seriously if you don't do good because there will be other contests. Don't. And also, like if you have a bad first run and you start to fall, don't get mad and throw your board. I see a lot of people throwing their boards, and that just makes you look worse. If you fall, just relax and take it easy and try to regroup yourself during your run because you only have a minute. So just make the best of that minute and don't throw your board. Make yourself look bad. The advice I would give a friend, particularly for the first time, would be it's not to be nervous, but um, just go ahead and do your best. I mean, it's not that crowd's going to do anything to you. Just if you go out there and skate and in the end, you know, if you do good, you'll get some out of it. You got to look forward toward that. That's the way I always see it, too. Take it slow. Relax. Uh, just, just think that you're skating with your friends back home in your favorite skate spot, you know? It's like, you know, like I said, it's no big deal. You know, there's plenty of contests, especially when you're amateur. There's contests almost every weekend. I mean, so it's not like you, if you goof up one contest, it's the end of your skating career or something like that. Plus, I mean, you shouldn't shouldn't base your whole skating career on contest or on or on a series of contests. You know, skate, you don't skate the inner contest. You skate because you like it, not because of contest. Hi, uh, my name is Joe Humaris. I've been skating for about 13 years, uh, seriously for about four years now. Uh, I don't know as far as. As far as uh, getting sponsored, I'd say the best way to do it is to compete. You need to compete, get your name out there, place well, and start putting together a resume. Especially now, skating is so competitive that it's very important to get together a resume because otherwise, you know, who's going to know what you're doing? I mean, you have to send them out to the sponsors and you have to, like, get your name out there. And the best way to do that is competition. Mainly because, I mean, with a sponsor, you scratch my back, I scratch your back. They want to know that you're out there, you're getting looked at. People are seeing you with the equipment and, uh, you know, write letters and try try to do a video too. Try to do a video of yourself. You know, try to do that kind of thing because that's also really important. Whatever you do, if you want to sponsor, whatever you do, don't call. Don't call. I don't want you to do that. Um, just send a letter or something. Send a video. That's what they want to see. They want to see videos. They want to see you skating. They don't want to see photos. Anybody can fake a photo. You know, you can, like, get up and do a totally rad trick and not even make it and get a good picture of it and send it in. So we want to see videos, uncut, no ed unedited videos. That's how you get sponsored. But you usually don't even try to go to uh, companies, just, just skate and have fun and let them come to you. Yeah, just don't think about getting sponsored. Like, like when you're practicing, don't say, oh, if I learn this trick, maybe I can get sponsored. Just sort of... Just sort of skate and have fun and let it happen. If, it, if it's going to happen, it'll happen. Hi, my name is Bruce Walker. I own Ocean Avenue Manufacturing. 
And two products I make are Ocean Avenue surfboards and Walker skateboards. We also distribute most major brand name skateboard equipment. We ship this stuff all over the United States and all over the world. I spend a lot of the time designing the skateboards myself because I am a skater. I've been riding since 1963. My company's been in business for the past 17 years, making us one of the oldest skateboard companies on earth today. One of the things that's really important to my company is sponsoring some of the best performers in the sport. I have 54 skaters on my team right now. These people are spread out all over the world. Seven of these guys are pros. The rest are some of the top amateurs. For example, we have Gogo Spryder, the women's world freestyle champion from Switzerland. Uh, some of my top pros that I have on my team, Jim McCall, Reggie Barnes, Chris Bauckham, Tim Morris, Yo-Yo Schultz, and Bill Robertson. These guys really help make this whole company work. And the effect that all of these team riders have is not only in the promotion, but also in the design of the product. They go out and ride the products, make sure they work well, they give me feedback, and, if, and besides that, everyone has different tastes. And we have 15 different decks in our line. Every one of them is different. My pros are different, they think differently, they all have different designs. And this really helps round out everything that I'm doing. So I put a lot of emphasis on my team. Uh, I got all my sponsors about like skating contests and they like saw me skate and they like asked me that I want to ride for them. I said yeah. My sponsors found me for Walker and Walker got me on Independent and local boys I got on them at a trade show by talking to the guy and he was real cool. To tell you the truth, I appeared in an ad before I even realized I was sponsored. This was in uh, 1981. Uh, I happened to look at a Thrasher magazine, and I was in there under Walker Skateboards. I'd been riding those boards in the past, but I, ne I never realized I was actually on the team. So it was kind of a weird situation for me. Well, if you want to get a sponsor, most kids like sending pictures and resumes and stuff like that to companies that might be looking for, or you might know a friend that skate for somebody. I talk to him if they need rides in the area, somebody like that. I mean, it's lots of different ways. It's all being in the right place at the right time sometimes, too, though. If someone came to me asking how to get sponsored, I'd tell them just to, do the, to go skate, go to contests, do the best that they can, and let a sponsor find them. One of the things that, that kids think comes easily is being sponsored. There's a lot of kids now that they skate for a year or two, and they, and they improve a, a great deal, and they, are, they, they get to a point where they might be able to be sponsored, but kids... It seems like today kids aren't willing to work as hard because I skated for, I don't know, seven or eight years before I was ever sponsored. I never even thought about it. And nowadays kids, that's all they think about is wanting to get free equipment and wanting to be sponsored. My suggestion would be to enter contests. If, the, if you really want to be sponsored, enter contests. You have to do well. You have to be willing to travel also. I'd tell a little kid that, that wants to be sponsored that comes up to me, I'd just say, uh, just enter, enter as many contests as possible locally and out of town and uh, just practice every day. Practice makes perfect and the better you get, the, the higher you're going to place. And like I said, if you place really good, you're going to pick up some sponsors, definitely. Yeah, and uh, with all that practice, have fun, you know, that's what skating's all about. It's about having fun. Not about sponsorship, it's about fun. How does a skater get on the Walker team? Well, there's not really a set format. It kind of happens different ways at different times, but probably the most common would be that I'll be at a skateboard competition and I'll see a skater really ripping, shredding, and if he's got the right attitude and a good healthy look to him and all, I, I'll typically ask him to ride for my team. Another way is that if a skater lives all the way across the country from where we are in Florida, some of the more motivated ones have put together videotapes where they show their skating. One of the things I like to see in the videotape besides just their skateboarding ability is also I want to see their face, I want to hear them speak, I just want to see how they handle themselves in general. Uh, sometimes I'll get a skater who is already really hot, already winning big national competitions. Other times I might take a skater who's very young and hasn't quite reached his potential yet and if I see that potential in a young skater I might go ahead and get him on my team and just work with him, coach him and hopefully one day produce a world champion. One good example of that one would be in 1978, I asked this scrawny little 11-year-old kid to ride for me. His name was Rodney Mullen, and three years later, after riding for Walker Skateboards, he ended up being, 
becoming the number one freestyler in the world. And for the past eight years, he has dominated pro freestyle competition. Rodney Mullen is a household word all across the world. So that's one success story, starting off with a real young kid with potential. Um, sometimes people will send me letters, sometimes they'll send me pictures in the mail saying, well, you sponsor me, I do this trick, I do that trick, send me a big long list of their tricks with a couple of still shots. And I have a hard time dealing with that because we get a real large, we get like 20 or 30 letters like that a week. And I don't really know who the people are that are writing the letter. I don't know how they skate. The still photos are hard for me to deal with. So what we typically do is answer a letter like that with a request for a videotape, something along those lines. And a lot of times I'll get, I'd say a lot of times I won't ever hear back from the people. Other times I'll hear back from someone who will say, well, you asked me to send a videotape, but I don't have a video camera and I can't find one. And there's no motivation there. And one of the things that I like to see in a skater, I want to see people who can get things done, people who can motivate themselves to get out and get things accomplished. And borrowing a camera, something along those lines, that's, that's part of life. And if a skater can't accomplish that, he's not really going to impress me too much. I, I just don't go by skating ability alone. One thing that I notice with a lot of kids today, they, they put too much emphasis on sponsorship. I don't know if maybe they can't go to school and face their friends unless they get sponsored by a skateboard company. Okay, it's all fine and well if you do, but sometimes people forget that why we skate. We skate because it's fun. And if kids today would try to remember that and try to concentrate on that and not worry about all this sponsorship stuff, they'd really come out a lot better. And they'd also end up being more likely to be sponsored because they'd be doing what they need to do to get sponsored. They'd be out putting the hours in. So I recommend practice and just calm down about the sponsorship stuff. It'll happen. If you're good enough, it'll happen.
What I personally get out of competition would be um, just a personal goal of how well I did in the contest. Um, usually beating someone that you've never beat before or something, that's, that's a goal right there. You know, it's, a, it's like if they beat you every contest and then finally you beat them, it's like, yeah, well, I moved up finally. You know, I finally, I've stepped up a little bit. So that's something to look at. Learning these tricks requires concentration and all your motor skills. You cannot do these tricks if you're on drugs. Skating is a natural high. There's a whole real world out there. Thrash it, don't trash it with drugs. Just skate straight. Now let's talk about equipment, clothing, and maintenance. First, clothing. Remember that skateboarding is a sport, so it is important to be comfortable and be able to move freely. There are lines of clothing that have been designed for making radical moves. So check your local skate shop for the hottest in streetwear. Aaron? Now let's go on to Bill Robinson. He'll teach us about equipment. There are many different types of skateboards. Please make sure the board you choose fits your specific needs. Many accessories are available to customize your skateboard. Grip tape, skid plates, rails, riser pads, and mounting hardware. These things can add to your skating performance. Speak to your local shop about your specific needs. When you buy a new board, grip tape is probably one of the most essential things you're going to need. Grip tape helps you stick onto your board like when you're doing an ollie. Grip tape comes in many sizes, shapes, and colors. In this section of the tape, we are going to show you how to apply grip tape to old and new boards. Grip tape sticks best on bare boards, so take your time. Trim, peel, and stick. If you're just adding some good tape designs to your board, first, trace the shapes with a the pencil, then use a sharp utility knife to cut out the shapes you just traced on your old grip tape. Then, cut out sections of the old grip tape to fit your new pieces. Cut it a little big. Be careful not to cut too deep, or you'll carve your deck, and not too fast, or you'll carve your hand. Just remove the old pieces and insert the new. Do tests with the new grip tape before you do tricks to skate safe. Some grip tape may not stick safely on plastic or rubber composition decks, so be careful. Those are my tips for applying grip tape. Well, that concludes part five in the License to Skate series. But I wonder what skateboarding will be like five to ten years from now. years the trick's gonna be so unreal. It'll still be around, yeah. The trick's gonna be it'll be like she's doing a 540 front side and back side in, in one move. On vert. And they'll be riding like three, four feet of vert then. They'll be getting to it. They'll have like little rocket cycle things on their skateboards. They'll be going like 20 feet in the air. Throwing kinds of stuff. Throwing it through their legs. Skateboarding 10 years from now, uh, the limits are unlimited as, as far as the maneuvers that will be, do, be being done then. Uh, there's no way to speculate, I don't think, because I, I've seen things over the years get, just get more radical and more radical. And it, you know, I've, I've had reservations about certain things being done, and then you know, a couple years later they're done, so it, you really can't speculate. I think skateboarding would be like in 10 years, it would be like, I think it would be floating sports, you know, boards that hovercraft type things, like they'd be floating and they have this George Jetson helmet on and they'll be able to go, you know, like Elroy, like do a McTwist and he'll think and he'll spin and, you know, his board would be like tidal magnets to his feet. That's what I think it'll be like, you know, <laughs> something like that. Five to 10 years from now, every kid is going to have a skateboard. They're all going to have two skateboards, three skateboards. There are going to be public skateboard ramps in every major city across the country. It's going to be on ESPN every week. Well, it already is. It's just going to go big, real big. Scooters, here to stay.
Dios.